Well, first of all, thank you to the organizers for um, having us all out here for such a fun meeting. It's a great topic. And um, this talk is going to look uh, really different from what we saw this morning in that um, my lab is really uh, focused on trying to understand the molecular mechanisms that underlie enhancer function. And our approach to that problem is to use quantitative data coupled to computational models. But I wouldn't consider us a big data group. Um, what you'll see are actually um, pretty simple experiments, but performed quantitatively to try to interrogate function. And so what I wanted to start with is actually this um, picture, uh, which is a cartoon. I'm sure you've seen many versions of this kind of cartoon. It's the one that's still in undergraduate biology textbooks about how enhancers, are, which are these orange rectangles, bind to transcription factors, which are the red balls, and recruit a bunch of cofactors, which allow them to loop up to the promoter and touch polymerase. And the idea is that this sort of story of protein-protein um, recruitment is how enhancers work. Right? So the regulatory DNA serves as a scaffold for recruiting these proteins, which recruit more proteins, and which loop up to the promoter. And this, this story is really anchored in um, a worldview of gene regulation from bacteria, right? which tells us that um, we can understand gene regulation from this perspective of uh, recruiting individual proteins to promoters. So a lot of the concepts that we use sort of come from those initial studies. One of the things that's become a sort of emerging hypothesis in eukaryotic gene regulation, and especially mammalian gene regulation, is that we actually can't totally uh, explain gene regulation in higher organisms with this simple modular view. And one complication is that it appears that many regulatory elements, such as enhancers, don't only contact the promoter, but they also contact each other. And this kind of uh, insight comes from high-dimensional, um, high-C data and things like this. So this is a sort of locus-level extrapolation of that hypothesis, right? That um, the genome is a complicated three-dimensional structure and that this modular view of one regulatory element contacting the promoter and driving a particular expression pattern might be an oversimplification. And so the, the story that I want to tell you about today is actually how we've been thinking about this problem in the context of a canonical gene in Drosophila development and how by working on that gene, we've got, we got a couple of different clues that led us to think about um, questioning this bacterial paradigm um, from a theoretical perspective. So we'll sort of land on that at the end. All right. So like I said, we study this problem um, in Drosophila blastoderm embryos. Uh, this is a movie of Drosophila development um, using lattice light sheet microscopy showing the early divisions of the syncytial blastoderm. So the fly starts out as an embryo with a nucleus in the middle. It, and that nucleus divides a lot of times, and, and uh, without cell, um, cell membranes forming, those nuclei migrate out to the periphery of the embryo until you get to this stage uh, called the blastoderm, where those nuclei are packed really close to the surface, and an enormous amount of transcription takes place at this time. One of the reasons why we like this system is because it's incredibly amenable to quantitative experiments. All the nuclei are on the surface, so we can use imaging methods to precisely quantitate the levels of transcription factors and expression of their targets using imaging. That was the focus of my postdoc work, where I was really fortunate to work with the Berkeley Drosophila Transcription Network Project, which was up on the hill and spearheaded by Mark Biggin, David Knowles, and Mike Eisen, who was my postdoc advisor. So that project really focused on using um, in situ hybridization and fluorescent two-photon confocal microscopy coupled to fluorescent labeling of mRNA and protein to figure out how you could measure the levels of transcription factors and their targets in individual nuclei in the entire Drosophila blaster embryo. This is a maximum projection um, image of a stained embryo where nuclei are green and two different genes are in blue and red. And then this is what happens to that kind of data after it's been processed into um, a, an image stack or, or from an image stack into a point cloud, which is a sort of computationally amenable representation of expression data, where um, we then get around the problem of only having a certain number of colors to stain genes for by uh, staining embryos with the same uh, fiduciary marker, so the same gene to register all the embryos together, and then partnering it with a different gene that we're querying. And so we can use that kind of basic labeling strategy to develop uh, three-dimensional um, atlases of average gene expression for an arbitrary number of genes um, where we have uh, data for 
you know, approximately 50 to 100 different transcription factors and targets in these 6,000 cells on the surface of the embryo, um, and their average position over about six different time points. So you can kind of think of this sort of data as um, spatially resolved microarray data for a small number of genes. And, but what I'm going to show you for a lot of analyses today are actually just line traces through this kind of data because it's easier to reason about, um, which would look something like this. So if you're looking from the anterior to the posterior of this embryo, um, you'll see a line trace um, where you see expression. We use a little trick where we normalize our expression values to the to a, um, a internal marker, and that's what this expression in the poles is, and that allows us to compare the absolute expression level, or relative expression levels between lines. So this might be an enhancer that expresses in a particular stripe, and a mutant variant of that enhancer that expresses to a lower level. And the average of the trace is this dark line in the middle, and then the standard deviation is the gray shadow. So that's the kind of data we'll be looking at. All right, so what I first want to do is show you three experiments that made us think that we should care about locus level effects, even in this canonical developmental gene, which is called even skipped, which is expressed in seven stripes. And the reason why I wanted to show this data to this audience is that I think this picture that I showed you at the beginning of lots of enhancers looped to the promoter is something that people are getting more and more comfortable with from things like high C data. But now we have a challenge, which is functionally, what does it mean for the expression of genes for lots of things to be looped together? And so I think that you know, these experiments um, have uh, sort of point to the fact that even for these really well-studied genes, there are quantitative effects at the locus level. Okay, so what's the first experiment that I'll show you? This is um, an experiment that's not usually done on enhancers, which is to, to replace them or delete them with an intervening sequence in a large, in a large piece. So this was actually done in a back. Um, and it, the construct was made by uh, Marty Ludwig, or uh, Misha Ludwig and Marty Kreitman, and they very generously sent it to us so that we could do quantitative imaging on it. And what this, this is the even skip locus. These little gray boxes are the enhancers. There's one that drives expression of uh, stripes three and seven, one that drives expression of stripes four and six, one and five, and two, the Eve stripe two enhancer usually lives here, and they replaced it with mini white. Okay. So we quantitatively stained this guy. Uh, which drives uh, expression of laxi. And you can see the wild type traces here in blue. And these are all very precisely controlled for time. Um, and then this is what happens when you delete the stripe 2 enhancer. So definitely stripe 2 goes down. But notice stripe 3 also gets messed up. So does stripe 7 and so does stripe 6. And so this is sort of one of those first hints that if you were, if you were to think about the ex experiment that people mostly do on enhancers, which is to take them out of their endogenous context and hook them up to a reporter, and see that they drive expression, that completely misses the, the fact that it influences other enhancers in the locus. So that's, that's piece of evidence number one that we should care about it. Piece of evidence number two is an experiment that we did for an entirely different reason, which I won't talk about, and took us a long time to interpret, but I think actually is interpretable in the context of this locus level hypothesis. So um, again, this is on the, uh, an experiment on the even skipped enhancers. Here we're going to think about the enhancer that drives uh, stripes three and seven together and the enhancer that drives stripes four and six together. So those are the, the pair of purple stripes and the pair of green stripes. And the experiment is to simply take these two enhancers and juxtapose them in different orientations to one another. Okay? And the way that I'm going to show you data from this is to just plot data from a single cell in stripe four. Okay. So this, in, this, in this stripe, we know that the expression uh, is being driven at least by the stripe 4, 6 enhancer, right? And the question is, what happens if the 3, 7 enhancer is around, right? So if everything is working totally modularly, it should not care, right, that there is another enhancer there, but it does. So if you stick the E 3, 7 enhancer behind the 4, 6 enhancer, the fold expression goes down by about twofold. Okay, so that's weird enough for the modular hypothesis. But if you move it to in front of it, it goes up. Okay, so the, the answer here is that enhancers not only care what else is around, they care where it is. All right, so these locus level effects are important in that respect. And then this last bit of evidence that I'm going to tell you is about a class of enhancers that um, have been sort of rediscovered in the last five years, actually based on a lot of functional genomic data, which are, they've gotten through a lot of different names. 
um, apparently redundant enhancers or sibling enhancers or shadow enhancers, which Mike Levine coined, um, which has been the term that's really stuck in the literature. So these are enhancers that drive expression in the same cells. Okay? So it's the, the single target gene is controlled by the expression of multiple enhancers. And I'm not going to go through the whole story of how we uncovered one of these shadow enhancers in the Eve locus. Um, but suffice it to say that the Stripe 2 enhancer, an extended version of it, and people have known this for a while, actually, was that um, this extended version also drives a little bit of Stripe 7. So there's a Stripe 3, 7 enhancer and a Stripe 2, 7 enhancer. And the experiment that allowed us to understand something new about this pair was that there's this really cool misexpression experiment that Steve Small developed, um, which looks like this. So you take um, a transcription factor and you hook it up to a different enhancer. So this is the transcription factor of Hunchback. And what he's done is hook it up to the snail enhancer, which drives expression along the belly of the embryo, where this transcription factor isn't normally expressed. And when you do that and you look at Eve, which is a target of Hunchback, you can see that the Eve stripes retract from Hunchback, and Stripe 7 does this weird thing where it bulges. Okay? So again, this story is published, so I won't go into any details, but um, suffice it to say that when you look at these two different um, Eve 7 enhancers, one of them makes this blob in response to Hunchback expression, and one of them retreats. Okay? So what this means is that in the locus, a single transcription factor represses one and activates the other. So it's like driving with the brakes on, right? And this is not unique to Eve. This is actually also true of another pair of shadow enhancers for Krupal, where there's one that drives expression of a distal enhancer and one that drives expression, or proximal, and that drives, they both drive the same pattern. That's why they're shadow enhancers. And they exhibit this little loop of hunchback um, bifunctionality as well. And they also respond to completely different sets of activators. Okay? So, this brought up an interesting question in our mind, which was, if they're not just redundant pieces of DNA, right, maybe they're performing some interesting circuit function in the embryo. Like, maybe there's something actually important about the fact that they respond to different regulators. And we wanted to think about... Um, and this is just a picture of that idea, right? So now we have this, this sort of cartoon in our heads of a couple of different enhancers that bind to different transcription factors, and they're both impinging on the promoter at the same time in the same cells. And we wanted to think about what kind of experiment might we do to test the role of these two different enhancers um, in both patterning the embryo and also understand how they might be interacting at the promoter. And I think this is a pretty common experiment to conceive of, right? Which is that if we have this situation where we've got two different enhancers and they bind to different transcription factors, what if we measured the output of each one separately and compared it to the output of the piece with both of them in it, right? But then we realized that, like, basically, this could, so let's say we measure A and we measure B, what do we expect? Do we expect to see A and B? A plus B? Do we expect A times B? Do we expect more than A times B? Do we expect the average? And we realized we didn't actually have a rigorous null hypothesis for this at all, right? And so we could do this experiment, but um, my graduate student was like, I wouldn't know how to interpret it. We could, anything we find here, I wouldn't be able to tell you what it means. So we set about trying to think of a piece of theory that we could do to help us clarify this null hypothesis. And what we realized um, was that what we needed was a piece of theory, right? So this sort of, um, this is something Rob Phillips likes to call um, figure one computational biology or figure one theory, which is a piece of theory to help us think of the right experiment. Um, and I, I just like these quotes about this you know, way of thinking about models in biology. Um, it says, models in analytical pharmacology are not meant to be descriptions, pathetic descriptions of nature. They are designed to be accurate descriptions of our pathetic thinking about nature. <laughs> Just substitute systems biology for analytical pharmacology, and you have it. This was pulled out by a colleague of mine um, in my department, Jeremy Gunwarna. Um, and Rob Phillips has a much more compact version of this statement, which is models are logical machines, right? So, so our goal here is not to build a model that's going to reflect everything that we know about transcription. We want to build the simplest possible model that's going to help us reason about this system. And I'm priming you that way because this model is very simple. Right? So, um, so let's remember what it was for. <laughs> 
All right, so starting again with this um, cartoon of two enhancers interacting with the promoter A and B, um, this, if you think of these enhancers as individual activating units, right, this is formally identical to this problem that people have considered a lot, which is two transcription factors impinging on the same promoter, right? These are just two, two potential activating units and how they're going to act together to control transcription. And the dominant framework for how people have considered the transcription factor, transcription factor problem is in this bacterial worldview of protein recruitment, okay? So this is what people commonly refer to as a thermodynamic formalism um, or statistical, their statistical mechanical models. What they basically do is consider how transcription factors bind to DNA, how they can influence one another's binding, and how they influence the binding of RNA polymerase, right? And here, the transcription factors work by decreasing the free energy of polymerase binding to the promoter, which is considered to be the rate-limiting step for transcription. Okay? So there's a huge assumption in this model, which is that there is one effective rate of transcription, one rate-limiting step of transcription. Okay? And um, there are a lot of really lovely reviews on this formalism, and it's been very powerful, and a lot of people have used it. But what we were struck by in trying to think about this formalism for our problem, which was, was that one of the more obvious hypotheses we wanted to consider was what if the activators that bind to these two different enhancers do different things, right? What if they're not, what if they don't activate in the same way? And so we thought that this was a pretty reasonable thing to consider given that even in bacteria, transcription is a cycle. And there are transcription factors that are known to act on different steps in the bacterial transcription cycle. And in eukaryotes, the transcription cycle is even more complicated. And recently, people have actually started to measure the effective rates of uh, the different steps in these cycles. And they found that there are actually multiple rates that are within range of one another. So it's not that there's one very slow step and then a lot of very fast steps such that you can ignore all the rest of them. And so what we wanted to do with this little piece of theory was to consider the following. Can we think about how transcription factors act on a multi-step cycle, right? And what kinds of things could a sort of framework like that afford you? And I think the kind of diagram that I'm showing here basically shows you that in the context of spectrum of rates, right, if we have um, a transcription factor acting on one of those rates, the overall rate of transcription is still going to be an effect of the other rates. Right? So you're not going to get a rate of transcription that's just equivalent to the transcription factor acting on a single step. OK, so what can this kind of scheme give you? Oh, actually, so here's what's underlying the model. I don't think it's important that we spend a lot of time on this because the math is really simple. I just grabbed this actually literally out of my graduate student's notebook. Um, she has amazing handwriting, um, which is that we consider a simple cycle where there are forward and reverse rates. And you think about the, um, if you want to derive a sort of closed form analytical solution to this kind of cycle, you can consider the rejection rate, which is basically um, how many times you're going to go backwards from a given node. And the total sum of transcription is going to be um, basically the sum of all these effective rates. So this, what this does is give you an intuition for um, how uh, the time you spend in any given step is dependent on the rest of the cycle. And so a really nice metaphor to think about is, um, and this may be because our collaborator, Al Sanchez, who is amazing, was applying for um, citizenship at the time. Um, he's like, think about a bureaucracy. <laughs> and how many times do you have to visit a given bureaucrat depends on how mean all the downstream bureaucrats are, right? So, so then if you see one guy and he's really permissive and you go to the next step, but he doesn't think you filled out your form right, you still have to go back and see the first guy, right? So um, it just gives you a sense that, like I showed you in that rate spectrum diagram, um, the overall time you're going to spend in any given step depends on what the structure of the cycle looks like. Um, in more detail, you can also use a matrix formalism based on stochastic chemical kinetics that Al and uh, Yane Kanji have developed back in 2008 that allows you to basically do this for any type of cycle with any kind of internal loops that you want. It's very straightforward. Um, we did this for an incredibly simple cycle just composed of two steps, okay, so that we could sort of go through all these different logical operations. So I just sort of want to whiz through a couple of things that you don't even need the mathematics for to intuit. The first one is that using kinetic um, control of the transcription cycle, you can 
produce all of the same sort of Boolean computations that you can produce using combinatorial binding of transcription factors to a piece of regulatory DNA, as, you, as one has shown in the thermodynamic formalism. Okay? So Terry Hua did that originally um, and showed that basically by different combinations of binding, you could make these different Boolean gates, and you could string them together to make all kinds of interesting computations. Right? And that's nice because it, it lets you think about how gene regulatory networks might be wired together. And you can do exactly the same thing in a kinetic formalism. And here's just a totally easy to understand example, an AND gate. Right? So let's say you have two different rates. Um, one transcription factor works on one and the other one works on the other. So if you only have one, you're still limited by the low rate of the other. But when you have both, you can get high transcription. Right? And there are, we elaborate in the paper, which is on BioArchive, that um, you can enable all the other gates, too. Okay. Here's another example. Having kinetic control of the transcription cycle allows you to integrate information over time. Right? Now, this is important because um, it allows you to enable these computations without the transcription factors having to be there on the regulatory DNA at the same time. Right? So what you can do is consider um, this is this is a simple four-step cycle with some time delay in between um, transcription factors arriving in the nucleus, such that you could distinguish between the order of arrival, right? If blue arrives before orange, it doesn't matter if you complete psych step four, if you haven't completed psych step one and nothing happens, but if they arrive in the right order, things can happen. And there was actually a recent paper from Mike Elowitz's group that showed that this is exactly the case for two transcription factors that cycle in and out of the nucleus in yeast, and they only work together to, um, to positively regulate transcription when they're out of phase. Okay? So it's, it's, a, uh, it's a formal possibility that you could do things this way. All right, so how about this last thing, which was the thing that we wanted to do the actual piece of theory for, which is to think about the null model of what would happen in our experiment. So first, um, what I want to point out is that in the context of the recruitment model, people have long understood and shown that the null expectation for how two uh, activators should work together is that it should be multiplicative. Right? And this is because they work on uh, altering the free energy of polymerase binding. Right? So because both of the, the free energy lives in the exponent, so both of them work on decreasing the free energy of polymerase, and that effect is multiplicative. Okay? In the context of a kinetic model, actually the null is that if they're working completely independently from one another, they should add together, their effects should add together. And so I'm just going to show this kind of plot um, to distinguish between those two null, um, null hypotheses so that we can consider further alternatives in the next slide. What this is basically showing you is that the overall change in the amount of transcription under the recruitment model is multiplicative. So this is essentially the deviation from multiplicative. This is the change in rate under, a, um, under the kinetic model um, so that this is the sort of deviation from the additive expectation, right? So you can see they're both falling along their, their lines. Yeah? Why is the expectation additive in the, in the kinetic models more obvious to me? The expectation is additive because you're considering two transcription factors working on the same step by completely independent pathways. They work on the same step. It can work, uh, yeah, exactly. So this is, we're just considering, so that we can compare the two, right? We're going to make the kinetic model one step just like the recruitment model, right? And now we'll consider it with multiple steps. That's a great question. Sorry, I didn't clarify that. All right, so now let's consider something with multiple steps. All right, so if we have two things working on the same step and we randomize parameters for how um, effective they are in working on that step, what we get is a distribution of values that are basically additive to subadditive, right? So if they both perfectly, if they act exactly the same way, you're going to get something additive. If they have slightly different effects, it just makes it subadditive. If they work on different steps, you get this sort of um, synergy that I talked about, and you get something that's multiplicative, almost completely multiplicative. And so that's just the, the yes, the um, deviation from multiplicative. So the reason why the annotation is different here is because in order to compare the kinetic framework to the thermodynamic framework, here you're, this is, um, indicates the change in the full change in transcription output, the total level of transcription, and this indicates the, full, the change in rate. Right? So what you have is the change in, uh, basically, the change in rate if you had both of them there versus um, 
the output if it's multiplied by the measurement of one versus the other. Yeah? OK. All right, and then the last, the last possibility here is that you have two transcription factors working on two different step, both working on both different steps, and then you get this sort of smear over all of these values. So what this really points out is that my graduate student was exactly right, which is that get, if we did this experiment of measuring the output of each one separately and then them together, we could not possibly interpret what we would get out the other side. Yeah, so that under a thermodynamic regime, um, we might get something that looks additive to set additive, and that could be a kinetic control, could be thermodynamic control, um, but we could also get these other things as well. And so instead, what I think this little bit of theory showed us is that we might want to consider doing a completely different kind of experiment, which is that instead of measuring each thing separately and then together, we should consider a duplication. Right? So in this case, we have two enhancers, we duplicate them, and if they work on the same steps, which they should because they're duplicates of one another, they're both going to influence the same step, and having more of them isn't going to help us. But if we have some sequence change in the second enhancer such that it behaves differently and regulates a, a different step to a more extent or a different step altogether, we should get some synergy between them. Right? And it turned out that we'd actually done an experiment like that many years ago, but we didn't really know how to think about it, which was this is the Eve Stripe 2 enhancer, one copy of it and two copies of it, and you get absolutely no boost in transcription. But if you add a bunch of binding sites for a regulator that doesn't have a lot of binding sites in the Eve-Stripe 2 enhancer, you can jack up transcription quite a lot. So this is just to say that I think it's consistent with the idea of um, a kinetic model here, and it's just an alternative for us to begin to consider. Um, and in the context of this meeting, I think there are a couple of interesting points for us all to think about. The first one is, um, and maybe this is just interesting for me to think about. There are a bunch of experiments that we've figured out to really test for the presence of kinetic synergy and whether or not it's a, it's a thing. Um, in a much broader sense, I think it's important for us to consider alternatives to this very prevalent equilibrium framework and what kind of constraints are there in the equilibrium framework versus the kinetic framework. So what sorts of things can a kinetic framework buy you that maybe a thermodynamic one cannot and vice versa? And I think this is especially interesting in terms of evolution, which is I would love to talk to people about more. The other really big challenge here, right, this is a very simple model based on effective rates, which is how do we link rates to molecules, right? So what's actually happening in terms of binding on regulatory DNA and other cofactors that might be there. And we've done some work on that, too, which I would also be happy to talk to people about. And then finally, um, in the grander scheme of things, if we now have to consider gene regulation not just at the level of single enhancers, but multiple enhancers which are binding to different TFs, how much of an approximation is the modular view of enhancer function? And um, if it is an approximation, in what cases is it? And sort of fractionally, how much should we care about it? And I think that that's important for us to consider as well. Thank you to my crazy lab, um, who are here featured in Animal Hats. Um, Many of the people, you can't really see Clarissa because she's eating Ben's face, um, but this is Clarissa. Uh, this is Ben. This is Ziba Wunderlich, who did uh, all the work on the a pair of Krupal shadow enhancers, and also Max Stoller here, who both moved on. And because I couldn't resist, this is our current lab photo <laughs> from this year. There was an exhibit of the Dutch masters at the MFA. Um, these are paper doilies. <laughs> um, but they're a wonderful group to work with, and um, it's truly a pleasure. And thank you for your attention. So when, in the last slide, when you said uh, experimental evidence for kinetic synergy, you meant evidence for the A plus B? Yes. What I specifically mean is. What the experiment actually demonstrated in, in, in light of the three panels that you've drawn? Ah, yes. Okay. So the three panels that I've drawn is. I don't think that that experiment, measuring A, measuring B, measuring A plus B, can actually distinguish between um, these models, either thermodynamic or kinetic models. Um, I think that's what our, our piece of theory showed us. It sort of pointed us to qualitatively different kinds of experiments. Um, the kinds of experiments that we're doing are uh, to take uh, an array of transcription factor binding sites right, and saturate it. <laughs> And then at saturation, add binding sites for a different transcription factor to see if we can boost expression further, right? So that's outside the thermodynamic regime, right? Because once you're saturated, you should be. So 
you present it as if the thermodynamics model must predict an activation synergy due to multiple um, due to multiple bound activators acting together, and that the the kinetic model, you know, uh, uh, would not pre predict that that synergy by default uh, because it, uh, there are separate sets. Is, is that how you presented it? No, I think I think the way I would I would summarize it in those terms is that. What you want out of your null hypothesis, right, is to tell you whether something beyond independent action is happening, right? So, like, it, it, and the, in a thermodynamic framework, what you would expect by from independent action of two elements, be they transcription factors or enhancers, is multiplicative output. No, that's what I was going to talk right? about. You need not have that. You can have you can have constraints on that model which which prohibit. Uh, independent action within the thermodynamics framework, and then you'll get the same. Uh, but uh, so exactly, but without independent. So that tells you if you saw that, you would say, ah, they don't act independently, okay. right? It requires some different. It requires some interaction in the system such that they don't act independently, and so that would be interesting to follow up. I think the problem is that because the null models of independent action themselves can give you such a variety of behaviors depending on whether or not you assume it's a thermodynamic or kinetic view. Like, I couldn't tell you whether or not something sort of interesting beyond independence was happening in those experiments. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, oh, sorry. Well, so just to follow up on this, you know, let's yeah. say Pull two could be recruited indirectly via factor A or factor B, right? Then, in the context of just the equilibrium model, you could still have additivity of the contribution of A and B to binding. Say so, again. Well, if you have a you know factor A binding to binding site A, could yep. we recruit pull two, right? Yep. Because there's like an A pull two interaction, and protein B could bind to site B, but also interact with pull two, right? So then the probability that pull two is recruited at low concentrations of those proteins is just the sum of the of the two. So I'm not sure that it's necessarily a kinetic view that, you know, if you have additivity. I think you can have additivity within that. At least, you know, it's... I, there are definitely... I mean, there, there's a huge model uniqueness problem here, right? Which is that if I see multiplicativity or I see additivity, there are ways of wrangling the... Um, underlying model such that you could explain it with one or the other. Right. Yeah. Like they don't map. Absolutely. Absolutely. And undoubtedly, they're both playing a role, right? right? If, if kinetic synergy is a thing at all, right, it's, it's not that cooperative binding or sort of equilibrium view is completely irrelevant for gene regulation. These, these things are not mutually exclusive. I think part of my goal in presenting this was to just think about another worldview that might be important for rationalizing about gene regulation, especially in light of the fact that we think so much about transcription factors and how they bind to DNA, um, especially in terms of their equilibrium properties, but know much less about their, how they affect specific steps in transcription. And that's because structurally they're very hard to deal with, right? And so I think that that's a, if you, if you had an ideal data set for thinking about kinetic synergy, it would be the sort of classification by by function on transcription, which we really don't have for very many things. I think, I think it's a very interesting conceptual model for genetics. Um, I, I agree with others you know, that in principle, sort of equilibrium model can practically buy you any situation, but what it cannot do, it cannot resolve you the kinetic experiment that you showed. And I think this kind of experiment can definitely rule out equilibrium model. Because if you see a temporal response, that's something that the equilibrium model is kind of designed to display. So yeah. That's where we can actually suggest that this will support the kinetic model. But the experiment was not a temporal experiment. No, this one was not, but the, the Elowitz experiment. Temporal experiment. So I think temporal experiments are, would, would be best to actually. Yeah. The, other, the other place that I think it's going to be really there will be there will be big differences is actually in thinking about how you can move in evolutionary time from one regulatory strategy to another in the sense that in the kinetic regime you have the oper your neutral space is is different right in that you can add factors that affect rates that are are not uh, wouldn't affect your overall transcription rate so you have a different sort of buffering scheme um, and we're starting to think about that 
that now, right? So is there a way in which um, a kinetic regime is more amenable to exploring the um, sort of uh, fitness landscape in a smooth way if you want to move between one regulatory strategy and another? Um, and I, so I, I, I suspect that there is, like, there, I agree with you that the kinetic experiments are one distinguishing regime, and I think actually the evolutionary plasticity might be another regime. Even, even the kinetic may not, may not, even kinetic experiment may not fully resolve this. For example, we can imagine an equilibrium model where we say the fact that B depends on A being present, as if they're, they're imagine they're yeah. acting on the, on the polymerase linear level of DNA. Mm. If B's on the way, then A cannot do anything, right? right. So that, I see, that, yep. This is already implicit in the fact that once you show you can implement any kind of logic gates and string it together, you can implement these functions, right? So the, the only way you can tell it apart is by temporal dynamics. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, I, I'm glad that people are... are I wonder. I, I guess I would. I guess I would point out again that I don't know that proving that it's one way or the other is the is the mindset that I would go into these experiments with. I think that because they're not mutually exclusive, I think it's just a, it's a regulatory regime that may also play a role, right? Um, and the in, and there is I think a very deep problem of model uniqueness. As dynamic measurements get better and better, it may be that it's more parsimonious to explain a lot of that stuff in a kinetic regime than it is in a thermodynamic regime. Um, so I have a question. So, um, if you can so we, uh, implement any logic gate, but nevertheless, if you assume that a particular transcription factor will have uh, the same role in independent of what is the other partner, whether using uh, looking at the experiment that involves a lot of pairs of transcription factors, and under the assumption that each transcription factors have always the same role, in the logic gate, you cannot distinguish the models. Uh, you mean experimentally, if you were just to try empirically define them based on classes? That is than looking at two classes, for fact, looks at like 100 of pairs of them. Yeah. Repeating many of transcription factors. I don't think that, so I think the other reason why this, this model is interesting to me is that it, <coughs> It doesn't exclude the fact that transcription factors can have context-dependent function. And in fact, it doesn't even require that transcription factors act exclusively on one step. They can act on multiple steps. They just have to act on multiple steps in slightly different ways. Right? You get the same combinatorial logic out of two transcription factors that both work on steps one, two, and three, as long as they do it to different extents. Right? And so I, I think it, it, it's not... It's not too hard to imagine those context, those parameters changing in a context-dependent way. I think the other thing that, that thinking about things in this way again just sort of makes makes one think about different kinds of experiments that you might do. Is it casts the promoter in a very active role in terms of setting the spectrum of effective rates that enhancers have to work on, right? So that's another sort of category ex of experiments that you might imagine is to take a given enhancer and test it against multiple different promoters, or to even take a given set of pro uh, you know a given set of promoters and test for the sort of spectrum of effective rates that they that they exhibit. And so, again, I think it just sort of spurs you to think about the problem in a slightly different way. Yeah. Say something about what you have in mind with what are the kinetic steps along the cycle because I mean the more I'm thinking about it in my mind right is I can also say any kind of state the promoter can take on which mm -hmm. is sort of any combination of what factors are bound to what sides yep. is a different state and the promoter is moving between these states in a stochastic manner by yep. binding and unbinding of individual factors and the yep. rates can be depending on what the current state is in a complicated way right sure so yeah that starts looking very very much like your model Right, right. Well, so I think that I, no, so what, what yes. sort of mechanistically do you have actually in mind when you think of these steps? Well, so it's important to remember that the model is effective rates, right? So these are things that are bundled together into effective rates. They do not have to be specific molecular states, right? And so in that in that sense. I think you can abstract out the molecular details. It's those those plots of spectrums of rates that I showed you from Jeff Gellis's lab in the context of promoters. To lose the difference between thermodynamic and kinetic, that it just all becomes the same. I, I mean, disagree because in the thermodynamic. 
there is also kinetics in binding and unbinding of transcription factors, even within a thermodynamic model, right? I think the key question, though, is that the, the fundamental assumption in the thermodynamic framework is that there is a single rate limiting step that everything gets piped through, right? right. All activators act in the That's same exactly way. What I want to get to, because there is one step where ATP gets burned, and that introduces a reversibility in the model which is no longer in equilibrium, right? Yes. And so if you want to say that there are several steps in which ATP is burned and it's irreversible, then I'd like to know what you have in mind. I think there are a lot of different steps where ATP gets burned in eukaryotic transcription, right? I, Help me out. Tell me a couple. About nucleosome modification or remodeling. Yes. How about post-translational modification of transcription factors? There is an ultimate okay. step on mRNA's release. Yeah. Actually, ATP being burned is not an irreversible step. It's, just, it's irreversible, but then this polymerase leaves and a new one comes, and that's it. And you forget about this university, so it becomes... becomes CTD modification. When MRNA is released, there is nothing you can do about it. Yeah. But, I mean, I think it speaks to this sort of deep question about epigenomics and, and or, you know, in its, or nucleosomes and their role in gene regulation. Are they permissive such that they're out of the way and then we can think about gene regulation happening at equilibrium? Or do they play an information processing role in interpreting transcription factor binding such that there is some active competition between transcription factors and nucleosomes where ATP is burned and it is an out of equilibrium system, right? I think that that's fully possible, even though accessibility measurements tell us that these regions are free of nucleosomes. Those, those assays are largely done at very high concentrations of DNAs, right? Like there are mobile nucleosomes in lots of active enhancer elements. Did and you so, also have such competition in the equilibrium context, like yeah. nucleosome mediated competitivity. Absolutely, absolutely. You don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be out of equilibrium in order to have nucleosome competition. But it does, it does change the way that you might think about the relationship of affinity to function of transcription factors if it's an out of equilibrium process, right? Such that, um, you know, broadly speaking, is it more important that your transcription factor is bound there for a long time, or is it more important that it, like, touches the DNA many times? Um, I don't think we have a good sense of, of which one of those regimes is true. I also think that there's, um, you know, the, the possibility that um, a kinetic regime might more easily reconcile with the strong functional role of many weak sites over you know, a few very strong sites. Um, so I've definitely gone way over my time. <laughs> I feel good, but I know, I'm very pleased. I'm, and I'm very happy to talk about all of these things, um, all of these things more at length. Thank you all for your questions.